Today on MedTech TV, we are discussing the wide world of surgical robotics. I'm Paula Rutledge. I'm Chris McLow. And I'm Reese White. And welcome to MedTech TV. So robotics is one of our very favorite things to talk to, uh, talk about here at MedTech TV. Uh, when you think about, I remember as a little kid, it was the Jetsons. And you know, just all the little, the little toys, you thought, oh, that'll never happen. And here <laughs> robotics are just so commonplace. I mean, you got eight-year-olds with drones, you've got uh, folks doing surgery using robotics. It has really come a long way. And Reese, you have been uh, researching a new company that I'd like to know more about. So Yeah, so uh, last week we touched on a little bit of the uh, robotics that are happening in manufacturing and mentioned a little bit of that. But I, I did want to touch on a couple of companies. Uh, really what we've looked at, the majority of people when they think of medical device, when they think of surgical robotics, think of intuitive surgical and da Vinci. And there are, it's becoming a crowded market we're starting to see a lot more opportunity for diversity. And one of the companies that very recently has come out of their stealth operation mode has been Cambridge Medical Robotics. Uh, Cambridge, they're a little over three years old now. They've just released the first pictures, which we'll see if we can put up on the screen here. Uh, the system is made to be a lightweight, fast, easy to use surgical robotic system that mimics the surgeon's arm. And you'll see it has a couple different points of articulation. And then that wrist is supposed to have four axes of movement. Uh, really, it's supposed to hold the instrumentation the exact same way a surgeon would. Uh, the idea here is that a lot of surgeons, when they're learning to perform these minimally invasive robotic surgical procedures, they have to almost relearn the surgery. It can be kind of a long and difficult process, and the results are kind of tepid until they've performed 150, 200 of these procedures. But with this system, they're looking to make it a very ergonomic and more of a plug and play option so the surgeons can perform it the same way they have been. Yeah, they've been so stealthy that uh, you know, we haven't really found a lot about it. I know they've made some announcements mm -hmm. recently. They're starting to grow. Uh, they're not FDA approved yet. So obviously they've been uh, a little bit careful with releasing information, but I understand they just hired their 100th employee well ahead of the uh, uh, schedule that they were having. So mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely one to watch. So I know you do a lot in robotics as well, Chris. So how do you think com companies like Cambridge or CMR is comparing to some of the other robotic companies right. that are in development now? Right, well, you know, it, it, again, going to Reese, uh, you know, the household name was Da Vinci, right? It was intuitive for a very long time. But to assume that there hasn't been Skunk Works projects in some of the larger, you know, the Fortune Fives that have the deep pockets that weren't necessarily the scrappy startup that developed into a multi-billion dollar company, is crazy. So I think I think we're getting the press on kind of these, you know, kind of the smaller entrepreneurial plays that want to develop out, but I am more than certain there's probably some things in the works. And and not to mention Google's Verily jumping into the market as well as with the partner with you know, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, my my assumption just understanding how much they play in the general surgery space, that would be an interesting bet to assume it might be OBGYN or or general surgery, the very similar market that it is. And you know what's so funny is the the costing perspective has always been um, the kind of a kind of a hot topic, right? right? You know, from a you know from a you know from a robotic standpoint for how pressured the hospital system is on on you know preserving the cash and you go through a capital purchase as a, a you know a substantial portion of the budget uh, that's always been the biggest thing so if someone comes out with a a efficacy and safe robotic system that could be from a pricing perspective very competitive i think it'll have some legs i, I think that's that's the race right now to be honest with you because the da vinci system historically is a, a massive capital expenditure for for a hospital. You're thinking almost $2 million to put a system in place. And, and it can be difficult to see the return on investment for so many companies. So what we have to look at is there are all these different companies, all these different ro surgical robotics companies that are coming to the forefront now. You look at um, 
it was at Transenterics just opened uh, Centers of Excellence. I think it was here in Florida, right. actually, if I'm right. not mistaken. Both Transenterics and Titan That's right. have systems uh, in our, uh, where we are, is mm -hmm. Orlando, Florida, uh, just a stone's throw, throw from each other. Yeah, so uh, from here, so. Are, are looking to bring something different to the table, and, and Cambridge is about to throw their hat into that same ring. But I think what you see is after the Mako acquisition of probably one of the largest, most <laughs> headlining acquisitions to ever that happen in medical device, I, I think that you're really going to think everyone sees the money in it right now, and everyone sees the clinical efficacy. You make it faster, you extend your surgeon's life, they, they can operate longer. It's a broad price point. That, it's that a broad, you know, and I think I think it ranges anywhere from I, I you know, I'm assuming you know, a couple million down to you know, I, I think of a lower cost or secondary system being, uh, you know, but the the price point ranges. I think is what you were saying, and, mm -hmm. and what's interesting is if we can get that price point lower, there'd be there'd be the run. Well, that's the key. I mean, the first company, if it's Cambridge, that that comes out with an, a very efficient, with a cost effective option mm -hmm. for surgical robotics. Uh, it's going to be tough for other folks to touch that, but it, it's really a race to the bottom right now. But you've got to think, uh, or think intuitive, because you know they started what, 17, 18 years ago, right. and really I think set the bar incredibly high. Uh, and I think that that even some of the regulatory processes that really thwarted Transenterics uh, last year, when we thought they were going to get their approval, I think that you know now that the FDA is more comfortable with uh, the regulatory processes and robotics, you know hopefully there'll be other companies uh, to come to bear that can really help on both the clinical side, but also with the, the sheer cost of, of a robotic system. So, uh, so I know Transenterics is on the move. Do you know what applications uh, that that Cambridge is looking to come out with first? It's a lot of the buzzwords that you've heard from surgical robotics in the past. They're looking at urological, gynecological, gynecological procedures as well. They're looking at general surgery. It's the same places that you're used to. I think some colorectal as well, yeah. which... Right. Um, Med Robotics just had their first in man right. a couple was. of weeks ago for colorectal procedures. Right. They just received expanded FDA approval in January or yes. February, I believe, for that. And they're, they're the flex surgical system. Yes. Yeah. I, and so I look at, you know, companies like Med Robotics, and you know, going back, I remember the early days of Mako Surgical uh, when I was working uh, w yeah. with with Mako Surgical in a uh, consultative capacity. It was so much fun because it was you know a bunch of guys. They had a real Area 54, which was kind of scary, and <laughs> just kind of the velocity that right. these these startup companies come to bear with. Uh, and I'm hoping that companies like Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I'd look at Med Robotics was up there not too long ago, and it's amazing what they're doing, and they're, they're incre uh, increasing the applications that they have. So I'm looking for some really great things to come right. out of uh, right. uh, of Med Robotics, and then certainly Titan mm -hmm. has some some uh, some applications yeah. as well. Tit Titan, Transenterics. I mean, those those are the, I think the smaller cat names that we've looked at. Both are uh, obviously publicly traded, mm -hmm. uh, I think, over the counter. But I think that's what we're waiting. And Transenterics is is I, I think recently answered some questions in response uh, to the FDA. So, you know, don't necessarily read in between the lines. It could be good, could be not as good. You, you don't really know, but what would be exciting if, you know, it, it sounds like they're probably closer to approval if that ends up happening than anyone else in the market. It's, it would finally be competition. Yeah, and they've brought some really great people on board in all these companies mm -hmm. uh, lately. And I think it goes back to, uh, for medical device companies, it's hiring the type of people that can really move the needle. And some of the recent hires, certainly they've got some some strong people and have had at the top anyway, but some of the people that they're, they're bringing in, particularly on the commercialization side, I think the, the R&D piece has always just been a high standard for most of these high-tech uh, companies, mm -hmm. but bringing in these, these really strong commercial leaders, right. I think, are really starting to uh, uh, to move things along, and also on the regulatory side, y you think about you know, again Transenterics last year. It was just you know I think it was just a heartbreaker when mm -hmm. they had what they felt was a really terrific product, and they didn't quite make that last turn when it came mm -hmm. to the FDA. And I know that Cambridge is going to have certainly some uh, similar challenges as all companies do in getting things past the FDA. And I understand that uh, certainly as difficult as it he is here in North America. Um, the, the, uh, the European Union, through the CE mark, has been very clear that they're going to be tightening up and making the regulatory process as stringent there as it is anywhere. So I think that in terms of, of companies, you know, having strong regulatory talent is going to be as important as the commercial side. Yeah, the, um, the EU just, I'm sure that I was thinking a month or two ago, just released their new MDR regulations, which are going to be going into effect, I believe, in May of 
2019 or 2020, yep. but when that happens, the, the regulatory process for CE marking your medical devices will be significantly more difficult. And more expensive. More expensive as well, that's a very good point. Right. So it, it's going to make the barrier to entry that much more difficult. Right. Um, so right. it, it's going to be interesting to watch these companies that have been able to develop these prior to those regulations changing to see how well they're able to adapt as that, um, as that regulation comes down the pipeline and we understand more about it. Exactly. And you had another company that you were, were starting to chat with us about in a conversation last week, uh, one that I'm not as familiar with, CSA Medical. Yeah, a little outside of the surgical robotics realm, but something that's uh, definitely at the forefront of various types of treatment. Uh, we try to keep our eyes out for new types of technology or folks who are doing innovative things uh, around the country within the medical device space. And uh, this one is CSA Medical. Uh, mm. They work specifically in cryoablation for Barrett's esophagus, for esophageal cancers, any type of uh, malignant or benign tumors that are there. Uh, essentially, the system uses uh, liquid nitrogen to uh, freeze the tissues and kill whatever might be in there. It's Kind of impressive, but they just had an FDA release of a new type of catheter, which essentially cut down on their procedure time by, I think it was 50%. Wow. But it, it was a massive change for them, and it was something where it really came down to the actual manufacturing of the catheter, the way that they changed it, the materials involved. But they're another one to watch that I, I've really been interested in the technology, and Barrett's esophagus, um, this type of GI, upper GI cancer, is something that is not as well uh, not as widely, it's something that's not as widely known or talked about as some of the other cancers that, are, that might be more prevalent. So it's, it's, it's probably because of the, the number of patients, the for number of patients that uh, suffer from these, these ailments. Yeah, but it, it's, a, it's a cancer that's absolutely deadly if it's not caught in time. So it's something where this type of, uh, this type of treatment is absolutely necessary to have on the books. And CSA has got a potential solution for this. Mm -hmm. So terrific, terrific. There's just so much incredible uh, medicine taking place right now and, and new technology to take uh, to bear. And speaking of that, Next week, we're going to turn the page and talk, uh, talk a little bit more about the neurosurgical market. Uh, we'll be having Greg Drolshagen joining us next week and talking about some of the incredible improvements in visualization, navigation, and imaging as it relates to neurosurgical procedures. So I hope you'll join us. Don't forget, if there's a question that you have, uh, go ahead and respond to the uh, link at the bottom of your screen. If you're a company and would like to be featured or highlighted on MedTech TV, we'd love to hear from you as well. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for watching.